Another edition, the final edition, believe it or not. Hopefully you guys aren't. Oh, we got some sirens in the background. I guess that's a side of things to come for better or worse. The final edition of the Outside Shots podcast presented by the lines.com. The final edition of the season of the Outside Shots pod with myself, Eli Herskovich. You can follow me on Twitter at Eli Herskovich. At the lines US is where you can follow the lines.com. And at Justin Perry 8 is where you can follow my co-host for today's podcast. But before we get started, remember to give the video a thumbs up, subscribe, and ring that bell to get notifications whenever the Lions releases a new sports vet- betting video on any betting market in the content space. And also the Lions.com has given away another Amazon gift card on title game night for the NCAA championship matchup between UConn and San Diego State. Head over to play.thelines.com for more information. And as always, join the Lines Discord betting channel to get more bets on this championship matchup and future betting markets like Major League Baseball. For instance, Monoir crushing the MLB bets so far for us. So head over to thelines.com and sign up for our free Discord channel for more bets on any sports betting market. But without further ado, time to introduce again Justin Perry, he handles the betting product and content lead at Shot Quality. Really quickly, Justin, before we get into the title game, how did your bets go in the national semifinals? Well, you know, I had San Diego State minus one and a half, so that was a little bit of a tough loss for me. But honestly, uh, really excited to see San Diego State go through to the next round. Had a nice under result on the second game there with Miami and UConn hit. Uh, pretty safely there. You know, Miami not getting the 85 points again was a big help. Uh, And then a couple fun ones. I think, honestly, we were sitting here for the final four. I was telling you Miami wasn't going to lose by 15, and there was a point there where the (laughs) live line hit 15 and a half. I jumped on it at minus 15, and we got that one home. And then we also used the shot quality score on a live under for the first game. So that was fun. Nice. Love it. And digging into San Diego State just a little bit more, The Aztecs were as high as plus 800 on the live line in game. So hopefully some of you cash that if you were looking for San Diego State live, like we touched on in our national semifinals betting preview with FAU San Diego State and UConn Miami. But of course, credit to the Owls. The Aztecs defense did hamper down in the final eight minutes that one. FAU only scoring six points after the third media timeout. So Dutcher got his defense to really stymie FAU's offense, which we expected for, I would say, more so the full 40 minutes. Aztecs ball screen defense got dissected by Dusty May, who may be onto bigger and better things. The uh, almost, I would say, former FAU coach at this point and one of the better in-game schematic coaches that we saw in this NCAA tournament. Man, it's crazy, and we'll, we'll get into the championship game, of course, but To think back to the round of 64 when FAU was seconds away and probably minutes away if Kendrick Davis doesn't injure his ankle from losing in the first round in the 8-9 matchup in the East uh, region. And then they go on and nearly get to the title game against UConn and probably could have given the Huskies a bit of a fight in the championship Monday night. So credit to Dusty May. Hopefully the Owls are shot quality users for years to come or wherever May ends up. Hey, you know, uh, I I know Dusty definitely is interested in the shot quality metrics and honestly got to during my time over at the Garden. We actually hung out and saw some of the players in the stands and over at the hotel they were staying at. So I really like this FAU team. I think Dusty May, great coach, hopefully can definitely get them hooked up with some shot quality data and see what (laughs) they're able to continue doing. I mean, this is such an awesome story. I mean, we've heard about, you know, what it was like for Coach May coming to that program in terms of the resources that they had to be able to do this with like less than what Duke and Kentucky put into like 10 years or like half of a year, a quarter of a year even. Uh, is really, really cool. And and honestly, the beauty of college basketball. But yeah, uh, you know, that what you said about the San Diego defense is really what I'm so hyped to talk about. Stopping the, this FAU team from scoring at 
basically at all for the last six to seven minutes of this game. We saw it in the shot quality score. They went on a 17 to seven shot quality score run over the last seven minutes as well. So uh, they really fought hard to limit their opponent to taking those bad shots. And I think, I mean, honestly, I don't know if you saw me tweeting about it, Eli. I am still just amazed at some of the prices on this game. I think that, you know, we're basically getting told that Connecticut should beat (laughs) this SDSU defense by more points than they did Miami. So uh, that's just kind of hard for me to swallow. I don't know how you're feeling about it, but I think the San Diego State team will continue to be slept on, but stopping that FAU efficient three-point shooting offense should definitely be something to take note of. And just to go back to the semifinals really quick with yeah, UConn, sure. and I'll give my take. Don't want to spoil it too early <laughs> here, Justin. Come on now. But going back to the Huskies 13-point victory, of course, credit to Justin for catching his UConn plus 15 or plus 15 and a half that in game uh, hurricanes that is, but yeah, looking right, looking back to this run for UConn winning every single tournament game by double digits, I believe an average victory margin of 20 plus points. And the only team to do that through its entire run through the tournament or the only teams I should say Michigan State in 2000 when they won the title. The last team from the Big Ten, rest in peace, to win the championship. The Spartans back in the early portion of this century, earliest portion. Duke in 2001, so second earliest portion. And UNC in 09 with Ty Lawson and Tyler Hansborough. The Tar Heels as well in 2016, although they lost to Chris Jenkins on the buzzer beater. So... The only team of this group, and one more to go with Villanova, which smoked Michigan in the title game, but the Tar Heels in the 2015-2016 season, and more importantly, the championship game in 2016 in Houston, which was, of course, the second-to-last buzzer beater that we saw at this site at NRG Stadium. And Lamont Butler's buzzer beater to knock off FAU was the first buzzer beater in Final Four history when a team was trailing. So fun fact there. But the heels among these six teams, and I guess UConn with another exception because we don't know what's going to happen in the title game, of course. But the heels, the only team among these five that I mentioned, the only group to have not won the title after ripping off five consecutive wins in the tournament by double figures. So the market is in love with the Huskies. No surprise there. And looking at some of these openers, Justin, especially with some of our friends over at Circus Sports, got to give a shout out to our guy, Matt Metcalf, one of the best bookmakers. It's not the best college basketball originator when it comes to bookmaking hoop sods. Minus six was where he opened UConn. And that probably... You know, caused a little bit of maybe some eye rolls from batters out there, especially with the domination that we've seen from this Huskies team. Top 10 in both adjusted offensive efficiency and adjusted defensive efficiency per Kempom. And by the way, if the Huskies win the championship, that would mark the seventh straight season in the NCAA tournament where a champion was a top six Kempom team entering March Madness. Now, of course, if San Diego State wins it, they would represent a little bit of a deviation like I wrote about in my betting guide. And I'm going to get to a lot of things that I have written up in my betting guide. But of course, for more, I was up to 4 a.m. writing it. So hopefully you want to check it out over at thelines.com. I'm sure, Justin, you were grinding last night as well. But oh yeah, when, because you mentioned your thoughts and I'll get to mine on the championship game. But the opener again might have, Not sat well with some people. I was fine with it. Uh, We mentioned what our openers were going back to Thursday night, I believe, when we recorded our last podcast or our projected lines for the title game. I made this game between UConn minus four and four and a half. So money line price around plus 180, plus 185. The fact that it's sitting where it is in the market should tell you all you need to know, and I'll dive into many more reasons why I'm kind of surprised at this number. But I've I've said everything I've said about Matt Metcalf, so I know there were some words about shot quality, just kind of a semi-parallel to 
the number that we saw earlier or when the market first yeah. opened up, I believe Circa was the first to put a number up on this game. Jeff Benson tweeting that one out, a good friend of the show as well. But people had some eh, not so nice words about shot quality in terms of what the numbers said with San Diego State and FAU to an extent, but more so Miami and UConn, no? Yeah, and I think it's been a little bit more with UConn in the last couple of weeks. We had similar type of comments about the Arkansas game as well. And really what it comes down to, Eli, is that these have been kind of blowouts, right? And it's a little bit difficult to quantify the quality of shots when the game state has changed so drastically between, you know, something that's neck and neck to, all right, you know, we're kind of out of it, maybe taking uh, a flurry of threes to try to get back into a game. And so what can happen, of course, is that when you see results that might look as how UConn has, which is domination after domination after domination, uh, only two games under 20 points, like you said, hasn't been done too many times. But honestly, when you're talking about the history of the teams that have looked this impressive, what my mind went to was that we have like so much more parity in college basketball than we did 10 years ago, than we did 20 years ago in terms of the Blue Bloods not dominating like they used to, mid-majors recruiting pretty equally, NIL making things more even across the board. So to see UConn do this impressive feat, this impressive win margin over some very good teams, mind you, Gonzaga, St. Mary's, Miami. I mean, these are not jokes of teams. Arkansas, a really ferocious offense, honestly, in my opinion, and a great rebounding team. So what this all kind of makes me think of is just that, you know, these are tournament performances. It, it, you cannot win in March. You cannot cut down those. One game sample Houston. sizes. What? One game sample size. Right. Of course, point. they're one game sample sizes. And But the thing is, is that these one game samples require that type of amazing, unbelievable result for teams to continue to win and make a run, right? Like you need career defining performances. I don't know if Kemba Walker has like ever looked better than he did in some of his March Madness games on his run. And and I honestly, as a Knicks fan, it pains me, but like Carmelo Anthony, like, you know, what we see in this tournament for teams to go and make this massive run is often never recaptured because it does come with such an overperformance tied to luck. And I'm not saying that like it's so dramatic that it could never happen again because it's happened five games now for UConn, but they are shooting better than what we expect their individual players to do in that like randomized sample. If you were to repeat those shots, right. And then on top of that, they've lost in five, three of their five blowouts, they've lost the turnover battle by five and they've almost taken less shots. So when you talk about shot quality and, you know, we like to joke around our virtual water cooler that possession quality wasn't really catchy enough. But at the end of the day, it's really about <laughs> the value of every possession. Um, and and we weigh the shots, but it's also important to understand that you are playing a game that is kind of like statistics weighed on how many times you actually touch the ball. So UConn has won three of these games that maybe drew some comments, essentially with less shots, shooting incredible percentages and holding really good offenses to under 35, 40% while, you know, hitting 50% themselves. It's just, it, it's hard to have it happen so often. And again, all the kudos to UConn. I mean, if you don't know, they are actually a team that employs shot quality data to improve their own shot making. So they use our data to outperform their expectations. So clearly it's working. I, I really think that these comments show that shot quality is working because these teams are performing extraordinarily and the results are basically saying, yeah, this shouldn't be normally happening. And you kind of need to be okay with that in March because it probably shouldn't be normally happening. That that Memphis example, you know, FDU and Purdue, I mean, this is a crazy tournament. It's still college basketball. And that's why I like plus 300. <laughs> All right, so we got a. I, I go on the 98.5, the Sports Hub show, and they do a ring the bell. I can't, unfortunately, do a in segment. There we go. Like, kind of, go. uh, we don't have the noise. The yeah, exactly. We got the, but we got the motion, which I appreciate. So, a couple dings there for Justin so far on the Aztecs. Money line, and we'll dive into all those angles and much more. But I do kind of want to backtrack to a couple things Please. you said in there, and I'm glad you brought up a, a ton of them, a ton of great notes, obviously. Number one, Kemba Walker. This is a rematch. San Diego State-UConn is a rematch of the 2011 Sweet 16 matchup between Kemba Walker and the Huskies, who ripped off 
all those who wins at the Big East tournament to get into the NCAA tournament field, mind you, uh, after winning the outright tournament championship, the Big East, back then, the way it was with teams like Syracuse and Pitt and whatnot. So the old Big East, Louisville as well, before they shifted to the ACC, of course. And that Kawhi Leonard team, I think you can make the case, Justin, I don't know if you remember that game, but the Aztecs, right, the Aztecs, There was a, I think, a flop by Kemba Walker that wasn't called. And, of course, I'm not talking about today's flopping age. Although, the refs have kind of shifted away from that in the tournament from not calling or giving players technical fouls for the flop. They kind of just let it play on and and don't call anything offensive foul or nothing like it used to be college basketball last season and so on and so forth. But a Kemba flop that wasn't called should have been called uh, an offensive or what I, I forget the instance, whatever it may have been. San Diego State gets called for a technical, and that changes the entire script of the second half. So yeah. that Aztecs team, Dutcher pointed this uh, to this yesterday, that was one of, if not the best San Diego State team in that program history. If you don't want to say this team is, because people can make the notion that San Diego State got lucky on this run. Although I will say, you beat the number one overall seed, although a flawed Crimson Tide team, team, but what number one seed wasn't flawed in this NCAA tournament field, mind you. I think Purdue was probably the most flawed, and we saw what came out of it. The number nine seed came out of that East region. You get an underseeded Creighton team, number 60, that underperformed when Ryan Kochbrenner was dealing with Mono in the mid-portion of non-conference play. And then I'm backtracking here. I mean, they played Furman who was a testy mid-major, didn't shoot well, and was coming off an an emotional victory over Virginia. Right, bad matchup for San Diego State. And then you get, yeah, Alabama, you get Charleston, but still a pretty good CAA team. Granted, I think you could make the case that Charleston got a little lucky in their conference tournament. Okay, fine, then you get FAU in the Final Four, but... To knock off the number one overall seed in the tournament and a potential 3-4 seed in Creighton, I know I'm kind of making the case, but uh, I I will give more reasoning as to why I like San Diego State in this game and why we've been high on them, of course, throughout the tournament. I just think that conversation, and uh, again, another point that you mentioned that ties into this, that UConn still wasn't at their A game and they won that game against Miami by 13 points. Outside of Jordan Hawkins and the the bad sushi that he ate to give him the that stomach virus of course Houston sushi baby Houston sushi what could go wrong Houston we have a problem but outside of that man i don't i think you could say and this is a very surface level point that i'm going to bring up cuz all the other variables that go into it we'll discuss shortly after i think you could say the Performance that UConn showcased last night, because turnovers were a big part of that, mind you, could very well be a similar performance to what we see against San Diego State. Yeah, and I don't think San Diego State lets them get away with nearly as many of those shots. You know, I think you have, um, honestly, a, a team that knows how to interfere with shooters, knows how to, like, affect how these teams take those off the dribble threes and we saw that when FAU was kind of in their flow and hitting those threes that it looked like San Diego State was in trouble but I don't I mean they can just turn on that defense and I don't know that UConn has faced a defensive force like this yet I mean, haven't Gonzaga, faced a big like Nathan Mensa two-time right. Mountain West defensive player of the year yeah no it's it's definitely going to be a big deal and I think uh you know if San Diego State has any hopes of keeping this close and potentially winning. It's going to need to be essentially the best defensive effort that UConn has faced in this tournament. I, and I, I look, I don't think that the like the Gales are exactly in a defensive powerhouse. St. Mary's and then Gonzaga. They are St. Mary's, Mary's is St. Mary's, right? Is, Saint, but they just didn't Saint play Mary's, very well. Right. St. Mary's defense, ball screen defense, struggled down the stretch. Yeah. Granted, we saw UConn or. We saw San Diego State's ball screen defense struggle for much of that game. That could be yesterday. a big problem. That could right. be a big problem. But, but and look, 
I'm not going to sit here and say that like it should be like this 100% win for San Diego State or something. I still do think that there is very legitimate reason as to why UConn is a heavy favorite. And I do think they will win this game. But when you come down to the value um, and then, you know, also the points, I just it's this championship. I could see this one slowing down, those points becoming more valuable, big shots having more amplitude in terms of changing the direction of things. And Ah, man, this, I just can't wait. Like, I'm so excited to see how it unfolds, but this is, this is going to, is hopefully going to be a test for UConn because if they just continue to do what they've done, yeah, they will win by 15 if they continue to shoot 50% from the floor. San Diego State has to stop that or else there's really no conversation. Great stuff as always there, Justin. And a couple of things to acknowledge before we I promise we will dive into the deep dive analysis into this championship game. Number one, you credited San Diego State's defense, especially in the latter part of it, once again, very much so due for uh, the uh, just respect for how well San Diego State's defense fared down the stretch, fourth-rated adjusted defensive efficiency. UConn is is right there, I believe, the eighth-rated adjusted defensive efficiency per Kempom, and obviously one of the elite defenses per shot quality, too. But Brian Dutcher... You got to give him credit. And a fun fact, you go back to Michigan because Dutcher was the assistant coach on that mid-90s Wolverines team yeah. that lost in the championship game because Juwan Howard decided to call timeout and get time called out. Call timeout, get called for a technical foul. As a result, Steve Fisher was the head coach of that Michigan team. And of course, Fisher was the longtime San Diego, San Diego State coach before Dutcher got the head job. And unlike Juwan Howard, Steve Fisher did, or Dutcher, and of course, of course Steve Fisher, I'm of sure, I'm sure was applauding it. Dutcher did not call the timeout in the latter moments when Darian Trammell and Matt Bradley, they were both off the floor. And Lamont Butler pulls up and hits the game-winning shot, the buzzer beater for San Diego State. And then to that point, San Diego State. Now, this is worth noting, too, because as much credit as we're prefacing here with the Aztecs against UConn before we get into the reasoning as to why, San Diego State definitely fared well and got their fair share of positive variance in these last couple games because yeah. they became the first team in NCAA tournament history to win their Elite Eight game and their national semifinal game by one point. That's all time. That's not since the seed was established in 85. That is all time in March Madness history. So they definitely got the benefit of the doubt down the stretch. And to Dutcher's credit, when May called timeout in the final winding seconds of that game, he put in his best defensive lineup and then let Lamont Butler handle it. And, and Butler got a little space. I was a little wary of... The shot creation, I don't know if Butler was going to be able to get a shot off, but he did and did his thing. Uh, very much so full circle for me, considering Lamont Butler's issues against Arkansas in the final seconds of that Maui Invitational <laughs> game for third place, but came through last night against FAU. Now, digging into this game, Justin, in the championship game, ball screen defense is going to be a major factor as to whether San Diego State covers, wins it outright, or if UConn covers and blitzes becomes the yet another team in March Madness history, the fifth team of that group that I mentioned earlier to win every single NCAA tournament game by double digits and route to winning it all, of course. And UConn, yeah. both teams actually, by the way, going back to the offseason or, or preseason, November 7th, when the season tipped off, 80-1 to one to win it all at a couple different books. So pretty wow. wild that we get these teams in the championship game. But ball screen defense, San Diego State has not graded out well against no. ball screen D. And that, of course, was a big reason why May was able to take advantage for the first three quarters of the national semifinal game when FAU collectively shot above 40% from deep. Elijah Martin was a big reason why, and... Uh, of course, their shot creation off the dribble, just having a bunch of guards that could penetrate and, and get those open looks off of ball screen creation, essentially, stagger screens. And you think about UConn's offense and what Dan Hurley runs, they run that motion offense 
and they generate a top 73 point scoring rate and Jordan Hawkins, a healthy Jordan Hawkins is going to matter a lot in this game. So the big question is first and foremost, the advantage for UConn is if they're able to control the tempo and get those mismatches off of pin down looks, especially for Hawkins and, and Caravan and Calcaterra off the bench, uh, Aline as well off the bench, UConn is going to be able to get a lot, a lot of proficient three-point shots. And they may very well shoot 40 to 50% from deep to the percentage standpoint that you mentioned a little bit ago. Yeah, no, I think uh, that's all very, very accurate what you're saying in terms of how some of the focal points of this game in terms of like statistic lineups and abilities are going to match up. I'm I'm really right with you. The The screen action for UConn is definitely going to be an advantage. Uh, you know, people tend to run at San Diego State with this type of play. So I'd imagine that they should be expecting it. But again, it, it, this is how they're going to have to open up those threes. And, you know, you said something, honestly, Eli, that was really kind of stayed in my brain a little bit, which is, San Diego State has gotten their fair share of, you know, positive regression luck, if you will, not regression luck, but, you know, positive variance luck, if you will, right? And you don't get to this point in the tournament without it. If, and if anything, shot quality had them losing to Charleston. So, like, we, none of these teams that got this far did so without a right. few, like, expected To your, to your point. Shot quality is not an anti-UConn right. no, no. efficiency we love website by any means. No, it, look, here's the thing. When there's there's nothing wrong with recording a shot quality score that's lower than your actual score, it means you shot really well. You know, a lot of people see this like, oh, you expected them to have less points. Yes, because they shot really well. Like, there's nothing wrong. It's like a, it's a validation of shooting well. And I think, you know, people tend to be like, well, that's not what actually happened. Well, yeah, because we're sh- essentially playing the game. No shit. Right. <laughs> as, <laughs> as though people didn't shoot exceptionally well or exceptionally poorly. But basketball has that happen day in and day out and over the long run though it all becomes noise and you play to your median i mean it's just the beauty of stats right and i don't think i'd I'd be here without all of that because it's helped me stay sane in terms of analyzing this game and also trying to wager on it right like you need to understand that in the long run you're going to pull back and things are probably going to normalize we saw the normalization with Miami, right? We they they outperformed their shot quality score for a long time. They ran into a team that was able to lock them down and not let up. Honestly, I'm still shocked that Texas and Houston fell to Miami, but that's a story for another day. Dylan DeSue definitely yeah, played a role. Of course, of course. And there's game. always reasons. There's always things that happen in these games that make them so unpredictable. And that's why that UConn isn't minus 500, right? Because it's still college basketball. Um, and they, who knows? They might get there. They're pretty close already, which is crazy. But um, look, I, I think that there's so much to be said that these teams have kind of had the stars align a little bit like, you know, FAU maybe, and we don't know, right? All of this is very hypothetical, but if, if we don't see Kendrick Davis hurt his ankle, are we talking about Memphis here? Are we talking about that timeout being granted? Are we talking about like, you know, SDSU winning two games by one, like every single shot mattered in a game that's decided by one. So like you're, there's so much natural variance that shot quality is really just there to try to give you something to grab onto because I don't know what else there is in ter- besides like really just trying to understand box score luck yourself. Right. And I should say up until this point, and I don't think I mentioned it, I, I have those UConn futures. So Ooh, all baby. this anti-UConn conversation <laughs> and people could say I was hedging almost my, my futures bets with all this UConn hate throughout the tournament on these podcasts, but The turnover bugaboo that we're going to get to here in a second is definitely worrisome when Mm -hmm. it comes to the Aztecs ball pressure. And one other point, too, that I want to bring up within the context of positive variance. Some people are going to say that San Diego State is coming off an emotional victory. First time they're in the title game in program history, and they're naturally going to underperform. And that is why UConn is going to cover. I will throw devil's advocate right in your face and bring up a team that Justin, I think we've hit on every single podcast we have done because it literally speaks to this team speaks to positive variance, what it means to get positive regression throughout a tournament, even in the title game to an extent UNC last year 
Oh, they yeah. came off a semifinal win over their arch rival, arguably the biggest rivalry in sports when Caleb Love hits that shot and UConn won the game outright as I believe a four, four and a half point dog. Correct me if I'm wrong there, but I, I think that That's was the correct. point spread. Yeah. Think, yeah, I think, I, yeah, and I'm sure you could have gotten a better in game number, some good middle lane opportunities back and forth there in game two for sure. They, you can make the case that if the floorboard doesn't pop up, and I, I, I wish it didn't. I was in New Orleans for that game, and I had a Baycott that, MOP yeah. ticket at 22 to freaking one. So I, I, I think UNC, I think you can make the case very well that UNC wins that game if variants. Floorboard variance doesn't yep. go against UNC. I, I would say that no variance went against UNC in the tournament. I think the floorboard spoke and said otherwise. So that is a perfect example of, yes, positive variance went a team's way. And we touched on this, man. The first po- March Madness podcast we yep. did. Not to give ourselves a monster pat on the back or anything. Right. You could do it for me virtually. But Variance happens. There sometimes is a category, and mm-hmm. it, it may be outcome based, where a team gets positive variance and they have all these other prolific numbers that make them stand out. San Diego State's defense is definitely of that nature. Heck, going into last night's game, they allowed teams in the tournament to shoot a, a flat 17% from three. That is certainly getting your fair share of positive variance yeah. up until the national semifinal in the final four for crying out loud. But it doesn't mean that you're going to get blitzed in the title game just because of that factor. Yeah, uh, look, it's it's never, you know, in in statistics, it's memorless, right? Like, theoretically, just because something As bad a better, happens, you should think that way. Right. I mean, you should. You definitely want to be memoryless because baseball, well, baseball, basketball is memoryless, <laughs> right? Like, we... I mean, not necessarily in like shot to shot, right? Like players definitely remember things, but like in terms of like result to result, game by game, what has happened essentially doesn't impact it directly. But at the same time, like when you step back to the bigger picture, you would expect everything to kind of normalize. And so what the value actually comes from in my opinion, and you can obviously agree or disagree, Eli, is that people can tend to overreact or markets can tend to overreact and, and the, the money on lines can overreact based on what's been seen recently and create opportunities for us to say, well, if things go as expected or trend towards the expected, it's not going to go like how it just looked, right? The Sometimes the books, the lines, they are purposefully not memoryless because people see a team like UConn walloping everybody, being a team like Gonzaga, who everyone's heard Gonzaga is the best team ever. Like they beat them by 30. What? They're not going to beat San Diego State by eight. Like, come on, man, get with it. But, you know, you <laughs> dig a little deeper and what? That's like a historically bad performance for Gonzaga since the time they've become an actual like dominant college basketball school. And again, I'm not trying to take anything away from UConn. They have obviously played exceptionally well, but to think that what all the books are wrong, all the models are wrong because UConn has won every game by 10 and we're still projecting four to six points. It's just these are distributions of probabilities across the entire like millions of possible results that stem from every shot potentially rimming out or splashing through the hoop uh, how every offensive rebound like granularly like you know goes off a certain angle i mean i just found out that there are people who calculate weather measurements for the arc of basketball shots so every little thing can change the entire game and the goal is just to try to anchor self anchor ourselves down to something that isn't totally reliant on that luck that is inherently cooked into this game. I feel like we're going to get reached out to by the SDSU <laughs> SID or maybe the hey. athletic director himself. He'd be like, Hey guys, you want to come work for San Diego state <laughs> more than look, more look. Than welcome to at this point. Look, I, I, I understand. And I think it's I'm just, kidding, I, I, I know, I know, but at the other end of it, it's like, you just want to provide that context because I think there are a lot of people who are like, what the heck? Why isn't it 10? And it's just, it's still a college basketball game. Well, like, that's just, still, I mean, if those, right. you know, those batters are <laughs> not very happy with their minus six and a half, hopefully. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and to your point, 
going back to the Circa example, yeah. not even an example, just where the market opened at the best, one of the best sports books, most notable sports books out in Vegas. Matt Metcalf made the game six. If you go back yep. to the Super Bowl, you want to know what? The line was in the most efficient betting market across any sport in the NFL. It was Chiefs minus two and a half is where Circa yep. opened up. They got crushed verbally. Uh, whether it was podcasts or live sports betting shows or some, I would say more the bro kind than the smart types because a lot of smart bettors bet Chiefs at, at two and a half and, yes. and plus money on the money line. Uh, <laughs> maybe great, you were one Great of result. <laughs> right, exactly. But that's a perfect example of a line that opened up on the flip side of things where people thought the Eagles should have been favored and the Eagles closed as favorites, guess what happened? Now, there aren't scenarios in game. Like you said, every shot matters when a one a one score, literally a one-point result comes into yeah. play in back-to-back games. Certainly, yep. there, were, there were a number of plays that we can account for in the Super Bowl, but it's a good example of the market not necessarily being wrong. And I know those are also two up, upper echelon teams when it came to yeah, yeah. the NFL season. So you could definitely poke holes into that example, but the point remains is that openers aren't always incorrect, especially a low opener like UConn minus six. Now, I tend to trust the opener more than the market personally. I don't know. Again, I, I, I just want to make sure I want to say something about like my personal like gambling outlook. I do not look at who's on what or the money or how many bets are yeah. somewhere before the handle. Personal, I did a, I did a podcast game, last you know? week, right? right. I, I did a podcast with John Murray about this. And if you want to check it out, because there is some valuable information. He went on a funny rant about Texas too. If you had Texas futures, I know Justin and I, we I were did. both in that camp as well. And he made a, a great point and he dissected it perfectly from a bookmaker point of view, a guy who sees his own sports book, Post this stuff on their social media page that the handle is irrelevant and it should not factor into your capping, yeah, but go yeah, ahead for sure. No, no, I, I was just going to say like, that's kind of at the end of the day, it's important for me to just, you know, while we talk about what people are thinking um, and, and again, you can identify how the market feels or the way the trend's going or the conversation in the media. But I think when you start to say, oh, well, now that it's 75% of the bets, we have to go fading the public. The public can be right. The sharps can Fade be Fade the wrong. public. I mean, look, I, I've, I've had some of my best wins with the public, you know, it's, it's, I like UConn to like betters. Know. There are, there are mil, maybe not millions that may be an over-exaggeration, Probably a bunch close. of sharp. And I don't mean that by handle as in the sharp bets in the context of the, the money, when it comes to a betting handle, there are smart betters. I know that have been on UConn. The public has been on UConn. They have both cashed. It does yep. not matter. Yep. I fully agree. I fully agree. It's going to be really interesting. Obviously, it's like this microcosm of the micro battling against the macro because we're still talking about a single game scenario, right? And so uh, whoever loses can pretty much just shrug it off and be like, ah, well, you know, I saw the value on my play and I would make it again. And you want to know what? That's the coolest thing about gambling is that person's spot on for how they should be doing it. Like if you lose a bet that you saw value in and, and you can hopefully somehow prove the value was there, you just sort of didn't get your turn in the spotlight. I don't think you should ever be discouraged from playing that bet again and that's you know kind of the expected metric uh vibe short and, memory and motto yeah short memory and play as though things ha went as expected not you know in the beauty of sports which is full chaos randomization best player can get injured in three seconds and everything changes like there's just too much to sort of harp in on the one final result and say well that's the only one that mattered and it's like eh, it's about how we got there it's the process it's all about the process and hey, trust it, it. it's a, it's a great, it's a great nugget. When you go back full circle for me with San Diego state within it, within the context of the Maui invitational, because there, there were probably a lot of betters because there are people out there like this. And this is a great conversation. I know people want to hear the more in-depth analysis of the game. And there is one more thing that I want to bring up within, within the, championship matchup itself but I love this kind of betting podcast and I, I hope you the listener does as well there were probably a lot of betters that lost on the Aztecs maybe that backed with me that 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 bet with me when San Diego State lost against the spread got blown out by Arizona 
in one of those Maui Invitational games and then obviously blew the cover and then some to Arkansas in overtime. That Arkansas team that had Trayvon Brazil, a great Hawks team and obviously a team that had tire legs. And that's definitely a factor that we want to bring up as as well. Maybe I'm making a note for you, Justin, just so I, I don't forget because we're <laughs> touching on a bunch of different notes here. A lot of betters might have said, I'm done with the Aztecs, right? I'm sure there were people like that. You can't do that. As a better, you have to have short memory. And that's kind of the thing, right? And it's not to say that just because I like that you have the water battle here because you haven't had a water battle on previous podcasts that we've done (laughs) together. There were probably a lot of betters across any sports betting market that don't get that variance back with a given team. So I'm not saying by any means you lose a bet out of team, you lose a big bet out of team early in the season, bet (laughs) Bet a billion bucks uh, on that yeah. team when, it, when they when they play the postseason. Not at all. Not at all. But Aztecs, that's kind of what goes around, comes around. And you get positive variance. Things even out as a better. Hypothetically, they yes. should. If right. you're betting, if you're betting game by game every day, college basketball, and you're doing it the right way over the course of an entire season versus stopping with this team and saying no bet list kind of thing, which is just dumb. I've, yeah, of course. It's like I was going to say Creighton, right? Like they had such a cold run. Even UConn was losing in the Big East in the middle of the season. And all of a sudden you're talking about the same teams that made the Sweet 16, the Elite Eight. A lot of those teams at Maui were representing here uh, in the last couple of weekends, which is pretty cool to see. Um, Except but- Arizona. Yeah, well, yeah, they were in my final, man. I had them as one of the, my favorite like value plays, and of course they get Princeton out. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> I, I look, I still think that you know at the end of the day, you kind of want to come in almost with like a clean slate. Like I know it's so easy to see UConn has left this like burnt down trail of teams in their wake, and everybody's losing by ten, but. Ah, that's kind of what I feel like, you know, this line wants you to feel like, and you start to get into the psyop and I'll put on the tinfoil hat a little bit, but like, you know, everyone's talking about how dominant UConn is. And I feel like it's getting totally swept under the rug that, you know, both teams are in this final because they've gotten a little bit lucky and they have played exceptionally well. And that's really the only way you get here. Like, I don't think, what are you going to say? Oh, like, at least right now with the parity we have in college basketball, it takes luck and it takes exceptional performance. So um, both teams clearly have the ability to overperform, just lock teams down to make ridiculous shots, even uh, with the time expiring. But, you know, now we get this final battle to see, all right, which way are the scales going to tip? And then can the side that's sort of going against that grain, maybe overcome it with some of like the exceptional play we've seen UConn, it's going to be the shooting and San Diego state. It's going to be the defense. Uh, it's just, can they get around the opponent's like game plan to stop them from achieving their potential? All right. San Diego state currently seven and a half there point favorite or UConn is a seven and a half point favorite in the betting market. <laughs> Total is up a little bit as well. I believe up to one thirty two and a half, and I think it opened somewhere around one thirty one, one thirty one and a half. So we're see- seeing a little bit of steam despite this game, obviously representing the second in three days for both of these teams. And both teams have a ton of depth when it comes to not only minutes continuity going back to last season. Uh, to an extent, I know UConn lost four of their key players, including a ball dominant point guard and RJ Cole. And that's obviously what I want to get into right now. But San Diego State, I mean, you go back to last year's team besides Darian Trammell, Maybe I'm missing one other name, but this is a, and they, I mean, Micah Parrish, who had some big shots down the stretch, mind you, against FAU. A couple of the transfers, I believe Ladee was added to this team this year. So, uh, but this Aztecs team is loaded with depth and so is UConn. So maybe the minutes and the workload that both of these teams had to endure on Saturday night won't come into play in the total. We'll go over. I don't have much of a take on the over or under, to be yeah. honest. But turnover-wise, because that's where I want to hit on here. It's a big UConn, deal. UConn, 
Right, it is a huge deal. UConn, something I've hit on every single podcast and hasn't come to fruition yet. So hopefully it does in this title game. Well, I say that, yet I have UConn futures. So I'm going to be sitting mm-hmm. pretty. Look, regardless. that's just because you made a good choice. That doesn't mean you have to love them in every game going forward, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. I appreciate that. So UConn is ranking currently per Kempom number 236 in turnover percentage, 15 turnovers against the Miami Hurricanes. And those live ball turnovers, mind you, helped Miami get back into the game. And I wrote about this in my game preview, which you can find on thelines.com. That's really, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Justin, that's the first time all tournament we saw UConn really feel game pressure in the second I half agree. of yeah, this no, tournament. For sure. I mean, there when was Miami the... cut it to around eight. So yeah. if, if this San Diego State defense can do similar or have a similar impact with their ball pressure. And again, they, I believe rank top 110 in opponents takeaway percentage across college basketball, across division one. You think about Darian Trammell, their ball Hawks, Lamont Butler is one of the best on or up all defenders. I'm curious to see how Dutcher plays it in terms of who's going to shadow Jordan Hawkins, because Lamont Butler, if you look at, his stature. Now, he's a very physical car guard. These San Diego State guards are true men. But Butler, 6'2", 195. Hawkins, number one, has a high release sh- uh, point shot release to begin with. And I, I, you may see, I mean, Bradley could very well shadow, yeah. but I don't know if he wants to expend that much energy on a guy that finally came through for him in the semifinal against FAU. But Parrish, I think, is a decent shot to shadow him off the bench. We know how much Dutch loves Parrish, especially down the stretch in games. It doesn't matter for him who starts. Truly, that's the pure example of it doesn't matter who starts. It matters who finishes for this yes, Aztecs for sure. team because yeah. of how deep they are. So, But if, if San Diego State's ball pressure could generate some of those live ball turnovers like we saw Miami produce infrequently, even though the 15 turnovers sticks out, they weren't able to do so at key points because UConn was able to build that significant double-digit cushion like we've seen all tournament. They got it done in the early portion of the game, even though Miami, I think, cut it to to maybe a one possession and then UConn built it back up up until the half. And then Alex Caravan does what Alex Caravan does hits halftime buzzer beaters to give UConn a three-possession lead or bigger into the locker room. I know we mentioned it with San Diego State's ball screen defense and their struggles against FAU, which could definitely come into play against UConn. But the Aztecs' ability to get back in transition, I believe a top 50 shot quality transition defense is a big factor. But if they could slow this thing down to a degree against a UConn team that more so wants to play up-tempo and get those perimeter looks and also get to no go rim running in transition. Then the Aztecs, if that tempo, if those turnovers come into play more so early on and in the early portion of the second half, and they're able to hold off that monster UConn run. Evan Manaya does a great job of this when it comes to kill rate. UConn yeah. is one of the best kill rate teams in terms of, manufacturing those 10 plus point scoring runs. So if they're able to hold off those kind of runs for the Huskies, then they should be in good shape to hang around in this game. I mean, I fully agree. Um, You know, and I think San Diego state might have the defense that's perfectly adjusted to like stopping those runs, um, making sure that when maybe your offense isn't earning those points well enough that they don't let the opposing team get too far ahead of them. Right. That was kind of Miami's problem is that when they were missing some of those shots that maybe they should have hit um, their defense. could Poplar really was pretty rough shoot efficiency right. wise. Yeah. I mean, look, and I have it right here. Uh, you know, that big caravan rebound with like seven minutes left in the half, right? That was the final time in that game where the win percentage was at 80% or less for UConn. It never returned below that line really early, right? To get into that type of thing. It was 23 to 19 in favor of UConn at that time. Shot quality was expecting 27 to 19 in favor of Miami. So we had already essentially seen that Miami was taking all of these shots, getting more possessions, and essentially unable to hit them, and then allowing UConn to come in and score more than expected because the defense wasn't holding. So the hope here, and and I think maybe not the hope, 
helps the wrong word, but like the expectation here is that the San Diego defense has a better opportunity and a better, like, you know, profile to stop that type of scoring from UConn, to slow them down, to force them into those offensive turnovers, which honestly their offensive turnover rate is pretty bad. Like they do turn it over, you know, outside of like, you know, the top, like they're ball when they're stuck. Third. The key, the key there is because as good Jackson, Andre Jackson, he has been more so the elite Andre Jackson, or I would right. say very much so the elite Andre Jackson, as opposed to the turnover prone Jackson, like we saw when defenses were sagging off of him. But when teams can keep Jackson and this UConn offense more so in the half court, that's when you get those Andre Jackson, Tristan Newton, and Diara. Yep who did play some minutes more so than he has throughout the tournament, I would say. I would need to double check. But those are the three guys. And Sonogo when he gets doubled in the post. Although, it's going to be interesting to see how Dutcher plays yeah. it. I could see him going single coverage because you don't want to leave these UConn shooters, especially with the way San Diego State plays drop coverage within their semblance of a pack line defense. That's That's the reason why the Aztecs ball screen defense grades poorly on shot quality and synergy. Mm -hmm. So for sure, all those factors come into play. If San Diego state can keep this more so in the half court. I agree. I agree. It's going to be really interesting to see how it turns out. Honestly, one other factor and a couple of the things that I want to get to player prop wise, before we get out of here, unless you have something else, Justin, two player props, two player props. I want to hit on as I feel like I'm going to be killed by my girlfriend. I might be late to the airport. Believe it or not. Well, better rush through these props, Eli. (laughs) That's not going to go over well, my man. I think every podcast we've gone literally (laughs) over. Yeah, you could bet the over and have cashed every single every single podcast. I I, just to give listeners some context, right? (laughs) Exactly. I said let's keep this 20, 30 minutes. So we have gone way over that market. My girlfriend is well aware of that at this point, and I will be too. Very shortly. (laughs) Sorry, Adama Sinogo, player prop. I believe points prop. If FanDuel has the only 16 and a half in the market, everywhere else is sitting 15 and a half. And he has gone over his point total in every single game. I just want to double check here where we're sitting as of this recording on Sunday afternoon. Let's see here. Uh, we got Andre Jackson. This is a bit of live recording for you who's never done something like this before. Damas Nogo point total still 16 and a half. Still juiced to the over. Now, we've hit on this a lot in the podcast so far. Going up against the two-time Mountain West Defensive Player of the Year in Nathan Mensah. You have a you have a rope, too, off the bench. Now, he's not as lengthy as... Yeah, lengthy, because he's still physical. And remember, these are two bigs going back to that San Diego State team that had a shot to get the one seed in the... 2020 NCAA tournament that was, of course, canceled by, I think, first and foremost, the Big East tournament was the first tournament that shut down midway through. So just a funny note there with UConn being involved with the Big East and then the connection to this San Diego State team. But it goes back to the to the notion that these and and really just the fact that these Aztecs bigs are grown men and a rope and Mensa are probably the two guys that hold true to that belief more so than not more so than any of these other Aztecs players, maybe Matt Bradley, because he is, is his size as a guard is absurd yeah. when he's getting into the paint. But long story short, I, I do think, and I'm not sure if I'm going to bet it just yet, but that's the best number on the board currently. If you like the under, and I do think the Aztecs defense, interior defense may not even have to double and trap Sonogo to limit him in the half court. Uh, difference is, is, is if Sonogo is able to rim run and get those transition opportunities. But if this game is more so played at San Diego State's pace, although they do want to get those live ball turnovers and get out in transition when those opportunities do arise. But in the half court, if the context of the conversation holds true to what Justin and I have discussed, I do think Sonogo goes under. Yeah, I like it. 
What about the chalk quality data looks pretty similar as well. I mean, we had the 21 points against Miami to be a pretty big overperformance. We were expecting 15. Uh, Gonzago, he scored 10. We expected 13. He put up 18 against Arkansas, expected 12. 24 against St. Mary's, expected 18. And 28 against Iona, expected 22. So a uh, number could definitely be a little higher than what the shots he's taking should average out to him scoring. What about Jaden Ledee? That's another player that I look to still a low point prop considering and the depth definitely plays a role here. And something we haven't discussed enough is both of these teams are just in terms of handicapping the game. Both of these teams have have a ton of depth and it does kind of cancel each other out. Although the Aztecs ability to throw a bunch of bodies on you, if this game is played more at their tempo, I think kind of favors SDSU a little bit yeah. more, which might surprise some, but I do believe that. But back what's, to Ladee. What's the line on Ladee? Seven and a half. Yeah, see, I, I'm honestly, I'm with you on what really, you're going over, right? Yeah. Potentially. Yes. I don't know if I'm going to bet it just yet, but I do think those are two angles there. With yeah. The so budget. what he's had 12, six and 12 in his last three against Alabama, Creighton, and FAU shot quality expected 12, nine and 14. Uh, but what really sticks out honestly is that the possessions that he's had in his hand are way up. So only seven and four possessions against Charleston and Furman now 11, nine and 15 possessions against FAU. So uh, getting close to 10 shots in these games, honestly, it feels like that should be a good number for him to get to a seven and a half eight point line yeah I'm with you man of course and you go back to the latter portion of the FAU game I mean how about that that down three with under a minute to go and great call by Dutcher number one not to call the timeout I know I Mm -hmm. called him out on Twitter for it and he granted we'll say prefacing he was able to get his bigger defensive lineup in the game because may call the timeout but regardless still didn't call the timeout of the final 10 seconds of that game on the final possession, and I probably would have. But going back to my original point, San Diego State, number one, went two for one, which put them in a position to not have to foul and play defense. But he went to Jaden Ledee in the mid-range to get off that shot or in the low post, whichever one it was. Not Darian Trammell, not Matt Bradley, not Lamont Butler, but Jaden Ledee, an Ohio State and TCU transfer, who has played exceptionally well over the last few games, which you mentioned, in the NCAA tournament. So I, I, and you also think about UConn's mid range defense being arguably their biggest flaw and they are exploitable in the low post. And something I did hit on too throughout this tournament, who is the most exploitable defender on this UConn team? It's Alex Caravan for me. I know he's gotten better defensively, but that is a matchup that I think SDSU could definitely get the best of if you're able to get those mismatches in the half court with Ladee and the mid range and in those in, in the paint and with those paint touches with the hook shot and also with Johnson for that matter, that's the thing. It's tricky with San Diego state props, especially with the front court guys, because they're so deep and and who knows who Dutcher is going to roll with in terms of who has a hot hand A rope could have a big game Monday night for all we know, (laughs) hopefully, which is a tight game, no matter who, who wins it? But I do think Ladie is the guy to go with if you are like looking it. for a player prop. It's a low enough number where, you know, if things maybe even go a little bit differently than expectation, he could still get there. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm with it. I, I'm Again, I haven't really been the biggest player prop guy this season. I know uh, I've a little I. sneak <laughs> peek, honestly, since, you know, you guys at the line's been so cool having us on the show so much. We will have player props coming to shot quality. That model is currently in development. So uh, eventually we'll be talking SQ props and SQ points and how – players have been expected to do individually, not just team level. Uh, but it's it's a really interesting market, especially in college, because the variance is so wide open. Like, uh, so much could happen. It's not the same as, like, the NBA, where guys are going to get their X number of looks. It really depends who has the hot hand, who's able to really take advantage of matchups. Um, and I, I do think Ladie has a good opportunity here to get more than that seven or eight possession look that you want to get to eight points. So just to wrap it up here, our... Because it's it's hard to, you know, you, well, you don't have any futures positioning on UConn. So you did bet San Diego State yep. at eight. Would you yes. still take it at seven and a half? Yeah, no. San Diego State plus seven and a half is a major shot quality bets play, official play for What's us. What's the lowest the number? 
We would, so we look for around four points on spread. So we would go pretty much to five is about where we would stop playing it. Essentially, we wouldn't want anything lower than plus five. And honestly, if the total keeps climbing, if we get another point or so, if you can get 134, 133 and a half, we would probably recommend the under. And I noted this in my article. Be sure to check that out over at thelines.com. I promise I will throw in my for sure hedge when I do. Good luck. Of course, yeah, pull the trigger on it, but have not done it yet. I gave the example of the 10% hedge on a $100 bet if you were to bet the 50 to 1 UConn odds. Granted, I have UConn at 50 to 1 and then some lower limit 80 to 1s as well. So I still need to figure out what exactly I want to do, but Hmm. I am waiting for the best price in the market. And there are some 3 to 1s out there on the Aztec. So I am... some people also might make the case, and I noted this in the article as well, that you, if you have a UConn future, should just try to middle it because to the point Justin and I have been hammering home all podcast, we do think this is going to be a close game. So if you want to go that route, by all means, instead of hedging money line, but this could go one way or the other for me. So, and I mean that sincere, sincerely. Uh, again, I know I've, I, I've been a UConn hype man in the regular season and the antithesis of that in the NCAA tournament. But I do believe this game, I project it at UConn minus four, minus four and a half, and money line for San Diego State closer to 180. So I am definitely in the camp that this game could, not not a coin flip, but we could see a two possession, one possession game down the stretch. The last thing I'll say, Eli, honestly, on this point is that the the price, the expected price for this game was factored into the futures you were getting pre-Final Four, pre-Elite Eight, so pre-Sweet 16. So uh, to see it jump this much, essentially showing that like a rollover, if you were just playing San Diego State, is is now a lot better than like, you know, a future in UConn. People are really happy because they get a great price to, to hedge with at three to one instead of like... 180 or 190 which would be honestly acceptable for me as well so i think it shows that there is clearly uh value in the market going against what people are seeing um probably also indicates a little bit of book liability if the number has ballooned this much it's going to be fascinating i think this is a really cool like microcosm of line making and high liquidity trading at sports books and if you're really interested in handicapping and long-term profitability it's this is a really cool place to kind of dig in and start to understand what happens and what you're really seeing when lines move and money comes in so uh always fun to have college basketball paint a cool picture <laughs> no doubt before i get slaughtered that is justin yeah. perry <laughs> at justin perry eight the betting product and content lead at shock quality does a great job and have enjoyed these podcasts a ton that we've done throughout march madness you can follow the lines on twitter at the Lines US, you can follow me on Twitter at Eli Herskovich. Remember to subscribe to the Lines on Apple, Spotify, wherever you find your favorite podcast. Subscribe on YouTube as well. It goes a long ways for us over at the Lines when you do so. So we sincerely appreciate it. And of course, join the Lines Discord betting channel to get notifications on not only March Madness bets for the championship finale between UConn and San Diego State, but also the... Major League Baseball season. Mona Wara does a great job with us over at thelines.com. I know Justin loves Captain Baseball, too. So be sure to check his plays out on Twitter and wherever else he posts them. And also head over to play.thelines.com to get and enter your last chance for March Madness to win an Amazon gift card in our daily, or I guess, championship finale pick em contest. For more details, play.thelines.com. The coaching matchup is going to be phenomenal we didn't touch on that a ton but dutcher is one of the best in-game coaches and game proppers in college basketball i cannot wait for the championship game Let's between go. uconn and san diego state hope you enjoyed the grand finale podcast of outside shots presented by the lines.com for the final time this college basketball season so long everybody <laughs>